Okay, so the last video in week one, we are talking about uh, silverfish as a model for genetic analysis. So in previous video, I explained what is silverfish. I have explained uh, genetics and how to do genetic manipulation in silverfish. And in this uh, video four, we focus on toxicology and environmental study. So after all, it's a fish. So it's fish is found in water. So we may do a lot of uh, aquatic toxicology study, all right? Uh, but it's more than that because with this uh, small scale, we may put individual embryo or larvae into a 96 well plate. In my lab, I usually have 24 well plates or 96 well plates for this analysis. Uh, with that, uh, you may put different beakers or smaller size this uh, uh, plate you may uh, study uh, with uh, behavioral toxicity. Okay, you may take a camera on top and then trace their swimming pattern. And of course, you may do systemic uh, phenotyping, and then all those different genetic analysis could be done if you just collect the samples and do a DNA or RNA study. You may even study metabolomics because on these different wells you may do different treatments. Of course the treatments, I mean treatments or screening of drugs or chemicals. All right? And also uh, you may study uh, with uh, what we call reporter lines or transgenic lines of silverfish for this study. The good thing about this model is that number two, you can produce not just qualitative but also quantitative analysis like uh, you put some uh, environmental efferents or pollutions or polluting efferents into it and then you may obtain what we call lethal concentration or LC same or blood or effective concentration it depends on what kind of uh, enzymes or biomarker or phenotypes that you would like to study like for example, we study uh, deformities. You may study behavior, as I said, you may take a camera on it, and that would be known as a neurotoxicity assay. Okay, so that just gives you an intro on silverfish for toxicology and environmental studies. We have two models, well, one fish with embryo larvae, we call it one model. The second model, of course, is the adults. We have male fish and female fish, right? And then we also have uh, in vitro. So two models mean we have in vitro model in a set of L cell line, and also in vivo we have the embryo larvae and the adults. For the uh, adults, we may do a quantitative toxicity test. You may add into the fish with uh, water and then you may study uh, adults or you may study the embryo larvae you may do what we call LC50 or lethality assay from an adult or from the larvae you may study different organ okay? or what we call whole animal system testing uh, because you may study the, the gills, the heart, the digestive system, the reproductive system you may study cardiovascular system, you may study the nerve, the neural system, you may study behavior, you may even study uh, cancer, uh, carcinogenicity, you may study cancer gene, and of course from the embryo larvae you will study uh, developmental toxicity, and with the male or female fish you may study reproductive toxicity and so on. Alright, so there are so many things that you can do, the only limit is funding and time and of course manpower or resources for example dioxin uh, tcdd the most toxic chemicals that humans ever make tcdd is a 2,3,7,8 tetra coal dibenzyl dioxin and this dioxin is the most toxic one we have already used this model to identify the uh, toxic effects of uh, dioxin arrested growth uh, edema, affecting the heart, leading to apoptosis, and so on. And uh, we may even use the transgenic fish. In this case, the transgenic fish would have the promoter inducible by uh, dioxin. You can see hepatotoxicant, you can see that is the control, and the compound exposure after that 
you make sure that the, uh, the inhibition effects or whatever effects you got to study and then you may do analysis from the embryo you may study lifetime uh, damages okay and and uh, yeah you can study change in lethal morphology in this time the control is like this and then hepatotoxicant would affect the size of the liver <coughs> and then uh, also uh, reduction in number of hepatocytes the liver cells uh, fish is a fish so we raise them in water and then uh, temperature is around 25 so in the range of 18 to 24 degrees normal uh, alkalinity, uh, hardness and so on what I would like to remind you is that they came from fresh water and then uh, from very clean water so they are very sensitive okay? if you have uh, chemicals change pH, change salinity, the fish will die or tend to have less growth performance including like uh, ammonia they are sensitive to nitrate, nitrite, uh, chlorine and they are also sensitive to oxygen the oxygen levels will be high and so on alright so in other words it's also a very sensitive model for environmental study we may perform acute tests and also chronic tests we may use it to build up what we call as a model phase to build up water quality guidelines <coughs> because the short generation time we will study a lifetime test and we will study transgeneration effects I'll go into the details of them one by one First one, this is an interesting experiment that they observe silver fish behavior. This is the control, the fish normally would swim like this. And then by adding different concentrations of E. coli, you know E. coli is a bacteria you add into the water with <coughs> low, medium and high. Checking the video, you can see the swimming behavior from active, less active, to much less active okay so you may categorize this different local motion behavior and that would even able to study a neural network okay whether they sleep or not to sleep and then from these uh, medium low and uh, high levels you may study those uh, neural network you may change this different chemical and you may check um, you know many different uh, neural activity We'll talk about this more when we talk about human diseases, but this is just an example of how we can use it to study uh, fish behavior by adding uh, E. coli into water. This is a very recent paper. And then uh, in our study, we have embryo and larvae, and then the larvae we started to expose into different chemicals. We count for deformity, all right? And then after kind of with uh, phenotypic effects of deformity, we may collect RNA, do cDNA and real-time PCR to study gene transcriptions of biomarker genes. Like for example, this is on dowsing. We compare the control. This is another control. We added uh, cadmium and dowsing together. Uh, if you add them alone, uh, you do not see this effect, but you add them together, you can see a truncated tail, and then spinal curvature, you can see the curve here, and started to have this uh, edema, okay? So developing uh, embryos, uh, we have this, uh, this morphogenesis found in uh, superfish larvae, all right? And that's in our... Uh, uh, Recent paper, another paper, we study BDE 99 and 47, remember study c one a you can see that uh, 47 is less toxic than 99, or in other words, 99 BDE is more toxic than BDE 47. Looking at deformity, you can see that uh, high dose, 500 lanamol, actually uh, they don't die, but then you can see the deformity of forming this uh, Paracardiac edema and also the yolk sac uh, edema, okay, the paracardiac edema and the yolk sac edema. And then, uh, yeah, these images uh, 
you can make them quite qualitative and you can compare like for example the uh, curves with different concentrations and then you can put a line uh, to study what we call EC20 alright so this is the concentration we determine and then uh, of course uh, we don't apply too high the concentration because we would like to study the no observed effect level on Noel or the lowest observed effect, le effect level of Noel you can see that uh, no observed effect level compared with the control this uh, no difference okay uh, we call this uh, Noel and this is Noel and then if you move it up a little bit higher you can see more deformity comparing with the control okay so this is how we obtain all this uh, chemical data or information and make, make them more quantifiable a whole list of different chemicals been revealed by this uh, research paper dye uh, 2014 and then these chemicals including uh, heavy metals uh, like copper, zinc, cadmium, lead, mercury and also uh, the uh, endocrine disruptors like uh, described the BDE 47 actually is less toxic than BDE uh, 99 and then dioxin, uh, also very famous chemical those are aromatic estrogen trichosan or trichocarbon and uh, with string of A and also those uh, pesticides, endosulfan, heptacol and so on and also the organic pollutants are also uh, uh, copyrifos uh, and nickel chloride those are uh, <coughs> pesticides and you can see these different biomarkers or endpoint we may use uh, for gene expression studies so uh, i give you one example of my own uh, research oh this is not my own research but another example that you may produce uh, 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 for biological monitoring and that response element and the reported gene and then you may inject this into to create different uh, mutants that would under the uh, induction by contaminants would produce different color and these response elements response element are Yao or you may put a whole gene of atelogenin with different multiple Yao and then HRE, the aryl hydrocarbon receptor element induced by trace organic or mainly uh, TCDD uh, metal to induce uh, metal regulage elements in uh, methylothiolene or heat shock protein and also retinoic acid we have RARE and RSRE and then these are the uh, chemicals that would induce as you can see, the control is here. Other chemicals would induce different levels of expression of GFP. Now, the main thing of this, uh, or major problem of this, is, uh, is that uh, okay, you see the color. So, how are we going to quantify them? Okay. And number two is that now we know the chemical we add, but if it's in the water, how are we going to tell which chemicals are causing the problem? So actually, uh, is it just a simple hit and run approach, or uh, we may use superfish, like for example, as biosensor. You may give that a more detailed studies, uh, and of course nowadays there are different companies developing this different assay for testing of different chemicals. One successful story, of course, is to detect environmental estrogen. Okay, I don't want to name any company's name, but they provide a surface that you add the chemicals in. Now, this is not exactly from that company, but just an example that how we detect environmental estrogen. If the ER is the regulatory element, and then uh, the chemical will induce a green frozen protein. So, you know that the uh, solution to be test contains environmental estrogen all right <coughs> but uh, there are also many different studies like a recent one uh, they use uh, sediments and then these sediments are from uh, environmental contamination and then the sediments uh, you may do chemical analysis and also uh, add them in water and then put embryo in here we call it sediment contact assay and then you may study gene expression, deformity, survival and so on 
and use that as a good criteria. This paper was from Canada. So you know in Canada they have great lakes and also the rivers are concerned with the environmental contaminants that would produce problems that would affect fish embryo larvae. And silverfish is a sensitive model. Actually, I've done the same almost uh, uh, 15 years ago. We studied different uh, sediments from Taibo, Taipo, Fortan, and also Wu Kai Sa. You can see the different metals, zinc, copper, lead, and cadmium uptake in the embryo fish. All right? So it's always a sensitive model to study. And then later on, of course, we study biomarker genes, but I'm not going to load you with more data. Except to tell you that even our government, the uh, Water Supplies Department, WSD, they routinely been using uh, silverfish, adult silverfish, to monitor incoming Dongjiang River water. By the time they get into our system from the pipes, they have, uh, you may click into this website and then they show you how they put a camera to take a photo of how these uh, different silverfish swim together and then uh, if they change the swimming, swimming pattern uh, they would turn on the signal so that that particular batch of uh, fish would be some uh, 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 water would be sampled and analyzed for any abnormalities okay so it's a very good and useful and sensitive uh, species to monitor water quality. My own research also go into this uh, recent one to study uh, microplastic. So the microplastic in different sizes were added into the fish. We test for like uh, whether they would fit on them. The answer is yes. And then we can find those microplastic in the intestine. <clears throat> and then number two is that uh, we also study the biomarker genes like the one we mentioned before, C1A and VDG1. And then you can see a significant induction of the genes. And then there are also morphological changes. And then we videotape their behavioral changes by using a camera. And then uh, you can see how they swam. And then behavioral changes could be marked in different scales. You can see at different concentrations, higher concentrations, a longer time, and then they, you can see the different effects. We are testing them on a different uh, time point, okay, and then later on they don't even move, okay. And then, uh, yeah, so those were in vivo study, and now I'm going to uh, discuss with you those in in vitro study using the cell line in the coming slides. The assay we use is called dual luciferase assay using uh, this luminometer to detect the uh, enzyme level expression of fry fry luciferase. It's called dual luciferase because we have this vanilla luciferase as a control gene. So if we usually add these two plasmids together and this is like a reference gene, you know how much uh, DNA got into the cell and then in this system here we got this uh, receptor from, uh, from uh, 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 silverfish thyroid hormone receptor binding domain so any chemical that would hit on this uh, receptor would turn on the luciferase gene okay so that's how we, that's what we did in deals with a positive control it's a T3 or thyroslin hormone, T3, from our thyroid gland. And then all animals have the same thyroid hormone, T3. You can see the nice induction. We may obtain a EC50 value, so it induces half of the levels. Okay, so with this, we may produce a, a quantifiable data. And then we may compare BDE47, we test. This is a control from T3 induction, but if you add BDE47, you do not see much inhibition. All right? But if you add this chemical, BPA, TBBPA, or BDE47 alone, you do not see induction, meaning that these chemicals do not 
induce thyroid hormone receptor to turn on gene transcription. This is a positive control of T3. But, but however, oh, we also test the uh, LC50 values, so the concentrations we use are relevant and do not cause toxic effects on the cell. But if we put them together, uh, T3 together with uh, BPA, you can see significant inhibition of T3 induction. TPPPA also significant inhibition of production of the gene expression in terms of full induction. Okay, control is the one with T3. So the conclusion is that we have clear dose response and time cost. These are 24, 48, and 72 hour inhibition by BPA and TBBPA, those environmental estrogen or environmental endocrine disruptor could disrupt thyroid hormone as well. And comparing with uh, BDE, there's no or not much significant depression of T3 induction, so we do not find this uh, antagonistic effect. Finally, on uh, epigenetic effect, as we know that uh, Sibelfish uh, has a very short generation time, <clears throat> comparing with human pregnancy, we have the offspring and then uh, primordial germ cell, we can study the F2 offspring or even F3 offspring without the exposure to chemicals. But in this case, we use methyl mercury. For the embryos, we may have eggs and then we develop them into embryo larvae and after that they develop into a fish. Okay, then we may study trans generation effect. Okay, or in this case we study epigenetic effect. We study the adult genes. Uh, first we have on the left hand side those uh, activities or neural behavior. And then on the right hand side, we study the genes. We collect the sperm and study epigenetic analysis. Okay, with the same technique, it's also possible to study chance generation effect. That is to say that we expose the adult fish to chemicals and then study their offspring, similar to these studies. So that's uh, taken from uh, uh, New York Research Group. So in summary, uh, we could obtain uh, quantifiable data, LC, EC values. Uh, of course, you have to use correct dose, like what I have explained to you with the LC50 values determined. <coughs> and then we may do in vivo study and also in vitro study in the set of L cell. We have the positive control and then we confirm BDE 47 not inhibiting T3 induction. But other chemical did uh, BPA and also uh, tetrabromobisphenol A, they inhibit T3 induction of target genes. And you can see that uh, from uh, a fish or from cell line, we have reported gene system in vitro in the cell line, and that would provide more quantifiable data. And with that, we may study the molecular mechanism, all right? Because of the short generation time, we may use superficial to study transgeneration effects. And of course, for that previous slide, I showed you how they study the epigenetic effects, that it could study the gene in the sperms, whether they're hypomethylation or hypermethylation as well. Okay, so with this and conclusion, uh, is that the advantages of superfluid over is these advantages and could be a very useful model. I've explained uh, on the <coughs> left hand side the chemical metagenesis in previous videos, and also we may use viral vector, transposon, Casper, Cas9, ZFN, Talens, or even other technique called Tilling. And that would be for the genetic analysis obtained uh, from microinjection to study F. See the founders lines of the transgenic and moving into F1 and F2. We have uh, the embryo larvae for the studies. Uh, so basically, in conclusion, uh, Sibelfish is a trustworthy model. We have identified all the genes we need, and the genome sequence is long. It's easy to handle in the lab and actually inexpensive. We only need a small room 
with different tanks comparing with uh, other mouse or magnetic model, they are quite costly. And because they are small, so it's easy to handle in lab and inexpensive. And because of a transparent uh, embryo, we can study developmental regulation and also do gene ma the manipulation. And uh, finally, a reliable scientific community to work with and set FIN. The Superfish Information Network, you can find all the uh, transgenic lines available or you can find all the gene constructs available. And uh, with this, I stop here for video four. And uh, we will come back next week. We will talk about oh, these are the references for 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 this set of slides. And then uh, we come back for more uh, silverfish, focusing on the use of silverfish for human diseases. Okay, bye bye.